All right, Daniel. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, Eastern Kentucky. And tell me about uh, your parents growing up. You had mom and dad? Yeah. Yeah, I had both parents. I was blessed with great parents. Uh, they're both still alive and still together. They uh, have always been there for me. How would you describe your childhood in general? Uh, good. I had a good, happy childhood. I'm the... Uh, there's three brothers, uh, you know, there's three, my mom had three sons, there's three of us. I'm the middle one. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, there's that whole middle child thing, I guess, I'm, I guess I'm the black sheep of the family, but, uh, yeah, for the most part, it was a good childhood, happy, you know, that's great. What kind of made you the black sheep? I don't know. I don't know what it was. It, uh, I think it could have been early on, uh, you know, in, in school. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I traced it all the way back to, to elementary school where I went. It was kind of a, a rough school. And, you know, uh, it seems like my issues kind of started there back in fourth grade, I guess, mm -hmm. you know. But your your story is similar to a lot of people from this part of the country. It is definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All the way, I mean, you know, uh, nothing really chaotic happened or anything, you know, around, it was, uh, pretty normal for the most part. Um, uh, I graduated high school in 98 and, uh, I think in 1995, Oxycontin came on the market and, uh, it seemed like maybe 96, 97, it, it hit here. And that's when everything changed here. It was, um, uh, it was nuts, really. I mean, ridiculous. You it, saw it, this region probably harder than anywhere in the country. Yeah, it seemed to. You know, it. Uh, I don't know what it was about that, really. If it was the, uh, you know, the work people did here, they got hurt more, more susceptible to, you know, injuries or whatnot. But it didn't really matter what injury you had. It seemed like you could sprain your ankle and go to the doctor and get oxycotton. You know, so what you started to see was, you know, people that were great people you grew up with you've known them all your life you know good families you know you would hear about someone you know but vaguely you know something about them and and, and oxycontin and then you'd see them a year later and their life was just completely different you know that was a common thing and uh i don't know it uh progressively just gotten worse and then in turn i guess what you're led with was those same people became dealers to to support their habit you know and uh i don't know it it was new to everybody and it was just a plague of darkness really you know what, what, and, what percentage of people from your generation you think got involved um, got addicted i would say maybe six out of 10, you know, something like that. Maybe, maybe more, I, I, you know, um, and you, because all that was so new to everybody, you had, you know, a lot of judgment. I, I remember myself, you know, I would see someone that, you know, uh, had be become an addict and I would, I'd be like, you know, I'd never do that. I, you know, that's not going to be me, you know, um, and I'll just stick to my beer and, you know, that's, I can't become an addict, you know, and I don't know. I still feel guilty about that, you know, the judgment and, but, uh, I wasn't the only one. I mean, a, a lot of people said that and, but it doesn't discriminate, you know, uh, later on, I guess, uh, it would have been, I was going to a community college. And I was at a party one night and, uh, <laughs> I made a, an error in judgment. I, I jumped off of an inside balcony at this house party and, uh, I broke my right leg really bad, uh, three places. Uh, I've had six surgeries, uh, on that leg and that led to, uh, kind of my downward spiral, you know, I, uh, at first, after the surgeries, I was fine. I didn't, you know, there was no type of drug abuse at all. Um, but when it 
got to where I had to to go back to work and make money. I framed houses for a living and uh, I had to get back to work, you know, to support myself. And that's when I had to, you know, to have more medicine. And then eventually, you know, I was in full blown addiction. You know, I was in uh, pain management for 18 years. Uh, and that was the start of all, all my issues with it, you know. Yeah, it was uh, 18 years of, you know, bouncing around to different doctors, you know, uh, and everybody knows, I guess, that addiction's a, you know, a progressive disease. It just gets worse, and uh, it progressively gotten worse, you know, got worse for me, you know, and uh, it was a long, rough road. How many for years? Sure. Uh, 20 years. I had a 20-year run of chaos basically um what, what was your drug mainly uh it was it uh, with, uh, yeah the oxycontin uh opana methadone and then later on heroin and some fentanyl um uh, which fentanyl now is really bad around here and uh meth too but i strangely enough i think a lot of the meth abuse can be traced back to the the oxycontin issue too you know uh, all kinds of people i know that are now meth addicts they they used to be opiate addicts and they they tried to get clean and they felt so bad you know they were sick all the time uh, that's something a lot of people don't understand is just how bad the sickness can be you know you're when you come off a real strong opiate whether whatever it is heroin opana or whatever you're you know you just can't get up and live a productive life you know uh, and a lot of those people would turn to meth and, and you know they would be superman for a while you know uh, have energy they could get up and go go back to work whatever you know after years of not doing anything you know but uh then you see them six months later and they're you know they're in full-blown meth addiction you know which you know depending on who you ask may even be worse you know so what what kind of behavior what kind of trouble did you get into when you were in your uh in your addiction you know luckily uh i don't know how to explain this really i uh through all my addiction i don't know if it was because of my childhood uh i tried to hold on to my my values you know i had a strong moral compass through it all i didn't steal anything uh, i tried to always hustle and work for whatever i had to get uh you know it doesn't make me better than anybody i'm just you know uh it it allowed me to not get hemmed up in any real bad trouble you know i've only been to jail a couple times uh i've i about died a few times i've I've overdosed twice. Uh, I had a guy nearly blow my head off once with a pistol. How did uh, that happen? Um, I went to a place to, I was really bad sick and uh, crashing out. And uh, I went to a place to to get some, so I think it was Opana and uh, the person I dealt with, I thought they were home. They were supposed to be home. The front door of this little house was wide open. And I, I come up on the porch and I yell for the person basically just to announce myself. And I hear someone inside mumbling, you know, kind of incoherently, you know, you, I don't even really know what they were saying. And uh, so I step around into the front of the door and I, I say, I'd start to to ask for the person I'm there to see. It didn't get that far. I, I heard him briefly say something about the neighbors and the guy was sitting at a tray in front of a recliner and he was bagging meth up to, and uh, uh, he pulled out a nine millimeter and pulled up and leveled it right at my head and shot out through the doorway. And uh, it was, <laughs> That was the closest I've ever came to the straight, just instantly dying. You know, I did have a gun to my head another time, but 
you know, that was by me. I was going to take my own life at a different time. But, you know, uh, the experiences were very different. It was, you know. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, he leveled the, leveled the gun up, shot, and I was about eight feet, maybe 10 feet from him in the doorway. And just by the grace of whatever, luckily he, he missed me to the right. And I could feel the energy of the, the muzzle blast, you know, like my cheeks wrinkled, like the percussion of the, of the shot. Uh, you know, a shockwave travels a ways from a muzzle, you know, and uh, I guess I felt the end of that by my head. Uh, but yeah, it shook me up a little bit, you know. Uh, yeah, I wasn't high at the time or anything. I was sick and so I was thinking pretty clear, you know. Uh, that messed with me for a while. You've had trouble with the police too, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, some. Uh, it's a small town, you know, you, uh, classism's a real thing here. And, you know, unfortunately, once you deal with addiction, you, you know, you're going to be marked or labeled as an addict. You know, a lot of judgment goes with that. Once they know in any way that you're, associated with it then this is such a small place you know every time you move they're going to know who you are but so i mean there's a lot a lot of corruption that comes with that too you know yeah like for example i uh i went to another place one time to uh, to get get some stuff uh i think this time it was it was opana too i'd been in bed all day sick you know, deathly sick. And uh, the place I went to, uh, kind of next door, there was a, a woman that was really jealous. I, I, I knew her son really well. She knew me and uh, she had gotten word that I was coming to this place to get something. And I always had a bad feeling about her, you know, like an uneasy feeling, like you don't know what she's capable of. You know, she may uh, you know, she may knock me out or something, you know, and, uh, but I, so I went to, to this place that night to, to get some stuff and got it. And, and I, I could tell that she wasn't anywhere around her place or I thought so, you know, so I left and was driving back out. It was about 20 minutes from my house here. You don't just walk next door and get something. You kind of got to meet someone or drive for it. And, uh, so I was driving back out this country road and, uh, and I met a car and, uh, like I said, I'd been sick all day. I was fine to drive, good to go. And, uh, I meet this car and, and they, they shine a spotlight into my windshield and they spin around and light me up and get behind me. And, uh, it's a local deputy, you know, I knew him, but, uh, he let on like he didn't recognize me at first. And he tells me to get out and he asks where I'd been, you know, and uh, so I, I told him I'd been on a different ridge, a different road, and that, that I was bringing a friend of mine some propane. It was in the winter time, and uh, he said, "Well, I got a call that there was some drug activity going on over at this other this other ridge, kind of next to it." And uh, I said, "Well, I can't help what call you got. It wasn't me, you know." Uh, but he asked me to get out and. Uh, when he lit me up with his lights, I, I put the pills I had in a baggie. I, I put them down in my waistband, kind of right above my, my junk, you know, and, uh, I didn't put them way down in there. I didn't want them to fall out cause I knew, you know, what was going on. And, uh, I thought I'd be good to go, you know, well, he, he gave me a field sobriety test. Everything was good to go. I passed it. Uh, and he said, well, he said, there's something going on with your eyes. You know, he said, that's an indicator that you're, you're under the influence. And so naturally I, you know, I said, no, man, I've been sick all day. I'm good to go. I'm not under any influence. And he said, uh, he said, you know, I hate to do this. He said, uh, he said, I really hate to have to deal with this tonight. And at first he, he said that the first time I didn't think much of it. You know, I just thought, well, 
he's just acting like that. And uh, then I realized and heard other stories about him later. He was leaving me an opening to pay him off, you know, to, uh, to bribe him, I guess. You know, if I'd have had a 50 bucks to drop on the ground or something, I'm sure I would have got out of all of it, you know. Uh, but he kept saying, you know, I hate, I really hate to do this. You know, I hate, I don't want to have to do this to you. And, uh, so after the sobriety test, the field sobriety test, he, he patted me down and he put his thumb down my waistband and ran his thumb around the top of my, uh, you know, below my belt. And he, he found what I had. So, uh, that's just an example of what goes on daily here, you know, uh, had I not had that on me, I I still would have went to jail with just a DUI. Then, but because he found that, I you know I led to a possession charge and a DUI. But uh, it's just a I don't know. I've heard that about other small towns. How bad it can be if if someone knows, like for example, Suboxone is a part of my recovery, uh, uh, and for example, if of a deputy in your in this county or other counties like it know that you're prescribed suboxone you know they'll stop you and 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 they'll give you a dui for for having suboxone but even though it's you're illegal to drive on it you know uh, they still want to put you through the court docket you know keep all that full and going good you know um uh, and uh it just it just happens all the time here you know uh, you can try to you can yeah i could have got my blood drawn and chose to you know go that route and maybe fight it but uh it's, it's just an example of how it can be here you know so law enforcement is is part of the problem yeah and, it, and it's you know uh, there's a history of that too it goes all the way back to <laughs> I'm sure before, but you know, the late nineties with when, when Oxycontin became a thing, uh, you know, I can remember the start of it way back then, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's always been an issue, you know, uh, you know, you live in the life of, of addiction and, and heavy drug use in a small town like this, you, you get to know everybody uh see things and hear things that uh you you know you start to see just how bad it is uh and you know it may start with a deputy or a you know a volunteer or you know but uh, it, in some cases it definitely goes as high up as the sheriff you know all the way to the top and and has for a long time and not just here you know uh you know, other comp uh, excuse me, other counties around, uh, in other counties, it's been a bad issue as well. You know, uh, there was a, a really big, uh, deal with one in the, a neighboring county that uh, a journalist was actually able to take a sheriff down there for basically doing the same thing. It was a little different in his case. He was using drugs a lot more, but, and, selling guns that he confiscated and but uh he was definitely involved in bribery as well you know but uh i imagine any little small town it could be the same way but it's definitely this pretty bad here so so you you've gotten clean yeah and you've yeah. been clean for how long uh almost four years yeah yeah i uh i i've tried other times i mean anybody's been addicted for 20 years i mean you're going to have other i've been to rehab some you know several times uh but i just got to completely exhausted with it the darkness of you know it's hard on your on your soul to live this way and uh i found a doctor that actually cared about me and, and started taking suboxone and uh that's a, a part of my recovery i don't care to tell anyone but uh, I, uh, it has a bad rap. I mean, people, you know, they, they say things about it, like it's an opiate or it's just trading one drug for another, but it's not, it, it may 
work on the same receptors in your brain, but it's not an opiate. I mean, it doesn't make you high. You're not going to, you can't physically can't overdose on it or anything like that. But, uh, yeah, I was able to get in a good suboxone program with a, a good doctor that, that actually cares about people. They're not just running to, you know, to make money. No, this bunch actually cared and would, would work with me and wanted to help me. Uh, and that makes all the difference. You Are know? you still using suboxone? Yeah, some. Uh, I've tapered down quite a bit, but it is still part of my recovery. How is recovery today for you com compared to like before you ever started using? <laughs> it's, uh, well, I'm not going to lie. It's not all, all great. Uh, I mean, it's good. I mean, I'm blessed to be, still be alive and, and, you know, uh, luckily I, I guess I was, I've always been, I had the tolerance of a rhino, you know, I'm kind of, <laughs> Uh, I think if it weren't for that, I would be dead by now, you know, the amount of drugs I was doing, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's harder than I thought it'd be. It's, uh, I guess after 20 years of living that way, you know, it, the mental part of it's what I, I still have an issue with, you know, being able to cope with things. And, uh, um, I had an old guy tell me one time that, uh, he he's been clean 20 years or something and uh he told me he's like he's like the only way i can stay clean and be remotely happy is to do something good for somebody every day uh and he said not the kind of good that you're going to talk about or want you know uh not the kind of good you're going to do in front of somebody i'm talking about the kind of good that it might be little shit. It may be something big, but just something only you know about and the person you're doing it for, you know, you got to give back. And, uh, he said, he said, that's the only way I can, I could ever do it and be happy, you know? And so I, I started doing that and that's helped a lot, you know? Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think I just need to be honest with you. I need more, I just need to work on the, the mental part of it more, you know, is the, is the urge still there to use? No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, I imagine it's always going to be it. Uh, um, I have dreams, you know, I don't know if you know what a drug dream is, but you know, you, you'll have a, a blissful dream that you're, you know, that you're using and, you'll wake up and obviously you're not using, but I mean, that happens all the time. Uh, I, and I think a lot of it, it could be with, with me is the, you know, I deal with a lot of chronic pain. I've, uh, kind of banged up, you know, uh, I've got a bad back neck. And, uh, so I deal with the pain and I, I think that leads to a lot more cravings, but yeah, I, I, I imagine I'm going to crave it until I die, you know, uh, what, what do you think the reason this region is so like so many people are in, involved in drugs I, I think it's poverty you know this is the second poorest uh, well I don't want to say that well, it's one of the poorest parts of the country yeah it's definitely one of the poorest parts of the country but uh, uh, poverty definitely and I think that's the main reason uh and you know you as you've seen there's not a lot to do around here there's nothing to do around here you know unless you're into the outdoors and uh this area doesn't seem i mean if on from the outside looking in it doesn't seem um to be one of the poorest places in the world but it's one of the most beautiful parts of the country it's because it's surrounded by so much sheer beauty that it kind of kind of puts a band-aid on it you know uh but yeah, it's definitely got a lot to do with poverty and, uh, it's just a weird place. I mean, for example, cancer, the cancer rates are astronomical here compared to other places. You know, uh, I think that's got to do with poverty too and depression, you know, um, I don't want to sound like everybody's down and out and sad, you know, but 
there is definitely a lot of depression around here, you know. And coal mining is, is kind of dried up. And yeah, it's been, dried up. The uh, no, That was the biggest source of income. For yeah, them. yeah, that and logging too. And uh, so much of this area is public land, so there's not, you know, you, you can't uh, – really use those resources you know like like you can in other places uh so short of a couple factories i mean it's just little convenience stores and there's not even a, a walmart around you know so um it's yeah it's definitely a poor area and you know the the beauty kind of masks just how bad the drug problem is too you know uh Per capita, I would say that this this area is as bad as anywhere in the world. You know, uh, it just doesn't seem like it because there's not as many people. You know, um, and I'm glad it would be chaotic if there were. But um, yeah, it's a unique place. You know, and uh, there's some unique problems going on with it that hopefully one day will be better. You know, one decision can snowball into a a lifetime of you know darkness and failure if you're not careful you know um but i, I mean i'm doing better now i've uh, uh bass fishing tournament fishing was a big dream of mine you know when i was coming up and uh and that's all i ever wanted to do you know and uh luckily i'm i'm getting back into that now i'm moving on you know i've got a great wife i think uh i've had a great support system that a lot of people don't have you know and uh it can it can mean everything you know um i'm definitely lucky you know I know how full well how bad it could be you know i mean if it was straight up if i didn't have the people around me that i have around me you know i, I know there's no way i'd still be around you know you you, you go through this for 20 years uh, the trauma and fallout from it you know what it what it does to you mentally you know your self-esteem things like that uh you gotta have good people around you to to be successful you know it's very damn hard to do it by yourself you know i guess it may be possible but without the people around me you know i don't know i, I don't i think i'd be dead for sure or or in prison you know um i was definitely blessed with a a great support system you know i've got a wonderful life um we've been together 11 years she's been through <laughs> a lot of shit you know crazy shit she should never have to have dealt with um and my mom and dad you know both of them they've been great um uh, and i focus on on that and i think that's what has kept me from you know, they say not to, you know, you can't recover for anybody else. You got to do it for you. Um, and I do, you know, but, you know, I, I would spend the rest of my life making you know, making things up to them that that I put them through, you know. I'll gladly do it though, you know, but I, you know, it's, uh, you know, you do this for 20 years, you're going to have a, a lot of regret in your heart from it. Just the, you know, the amount of guilt and everything and, uh, if people have good people around them, they shouldn't take them for granted at all, you know. But, you know, I've had people ask me, you know, 
how did I do it? Or, you know, you don't hear about many 43 year old heroin addicts, you know, and, uh, but without them, I don't think I could have had a shot, you know? What, what advice can you give to families that are dealing with hardcore addicts like this? It's, you just gotta love them. You know, it's, uh, uh, everybody wants to do that tough love that, you know, try to teach them a lesson. There's no lesson you're going to teach them that you're not going to put them through anything worse than they've already been through, you know. Um, you got to find it in your heart to care about them enough to, to write it out, give them enough opportunities to, to get it right, you know. From the stories I've heard, yours, in, yours included, it seems like it takes a lot more patience than 99% of the people have. Yeah, and that's it, you know. But that's, you know, you could, I could say, yeah, I guess you could say that about everything, but it's definitely true here, you know. Uh, you just have to love them enough and be patient enough to, you know, you never know that the next try they may get it right, you know. What would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in all of this? Um, I would say I, without a doubt, I would say it's how important love is, you know, and what it can do and how strong it can be, you know, um, I, I don't know. I, I think that's, we need a lot more of it in the world. You know, I had a lot of hate in my heart for a long time and you got to let that go. You know, once you let it go, you know, you can go on living a good life, you know, or a better life, a more productive life, you know, it's a day-to-day -day process, but it's, you know, it's worth doing. All right, Daniel, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Mark. I'm proud of you.